Yep. Here we go. Although we won't get to about a K today. I'll, I'll imply a K. Okay. Um, but unit two uh, focuses on reaction kinetics. And when somebody says reaction kinetics, they're talking two things. One is how quickly a reaction occurs. And it's funny because, self-included, we usually think that reactions occur right away. And it's kind of like when I, we talk about the speed of light, you know, we think that like when you turn on and off a light, that basically that light does, takes no time to get to you. But it takes a certain amount of time for light to get to you. Similarly, it takes a certain amount of time for a reaction to occur. And actually, in lab, we're going to be looking at uh, some reactions occur very slowly. <laughs> And it's kind of fun because also near the end of Unit 2, we'll talk about why does it occur slowly. And we'll kind of, it's kind of like, um, you know, the Wizard of Oz where they, at the end, they get to see the wizard behind the, okay. To me, that's kind of when we talk about reaction mechanisms, we get to actually kind of see behind the scene what's happening. I think that is so cool. Okay, that's the pathways by which the reaction occurs. So I know we talked about chemical equilibria, um, in the previous part, but let's not talk about chemical equilibria right now. Let's talk, just talk about a straight reaction goes from left to right, reactants to products, okay? Nothing fancy going back and forth here, okay? Um, so we know in that scenario that your reactants are going to decrease and your products are going to increase. So if you ever see me write an R, I mean reactants. If you ever see me write a P, I mean products. So you figure over time your reactants are going to decrease and your products are going to increase. Now one of the things we're going to do here um, with part one is talk about how can you gauge how quickly that occurs. Well basically you can either watch the, and we're going to talk about molar concentrations, you can watch the molar concentration of the reactants decrease or you can watch the molar concentration of the products increase, the rate at which that happens. Okay. Um, cool. Well, we talked, uh, when we talked about the gas laws, we talked about direct relationships and inverse relationships. Something's directly proportional or inversely proportional. So, like, if temperature goes up, pressure goes up, you know. Um, number of moles goes up, uh, pressure goes up, that sort of thing. We also talked about um, a pair that were inversely proportional, and that would be volume and pressure. If you take a gas and you decrease the volume, you're going to increase the pressure. So those are inversely proportional. Okay. As it turns out, the rate at which a reaction occurs and the time over which it's occurring are inversely related. They're inversely proportional. And to show that, we can actually use the proportionality symbol. We just say that time is proportional to the inverse or 1 over rate. Now, I don't think of it this much. I don't think of it as much of this relationship as this relationship. Here's the deal. Um, well, I guess so. So, for instance, time. As time increases, your reaction rate decreases. The reaction rate decreases. What does that mean? It means it slows down. So, basically, as time marches forward, your, your reactions slow down. And we'll talk about why that is. But all, they always do that. Uh, one is you're just kind of running out of reactants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, that's a big one. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. It's probably the most obvious one. The other one, um, we could say that, um, uh, well, it's the same thing. As over, as, as time increases, your rate decreases. Okay, so reaction rates slow down over time. So it's kind of weird, but in a way, when we talk about how fast is a reaction occurring, what's the rate of a reaction? Well, it's always changing. <laughs> okay, so we do have a little bit of, we'll talk about like instantaneous rates, and we'll talk about rate averages, and we'll talk about kind of rates at a particular point. So. Isn't that the same for um, the closer could be. Uh, it gets to a saturation point? Yeah, no, but it could be related, but probably not okay. like we're here, so, mm -hmm. yeah. So, Reactants go to form products. So we're just going to kind of look at some bogus data, okay? So we're going to say, let's, and actually I say it's bogus, but actually I have a graph of it coming up. Let's say at time zero you have a 0.200 molar reactant, no product. 
Okay, we let it go for five seconds, and of course your reactant has gone down and your product has gone up. Okay, 10 seconds, you know, 15 seconds, 20 seconds. Actually, I printed this out for myself. So if you want to circle this slide, actually, we're going to kind of do some rate calculations with this data. Um, so it's hard for you to see, and, and we're actually going to do some calculations of calculating rate, but actually it slows down, okay, as time increases. It does slow down, but you're like, how can I tell that? And remember that the brackets here means molar concentration. Okay. Now, this little thing down here, don't worry about it. We'll probably get to it maybe Monday. You guys know there's no class on Friday, right? No class on Friday. Okay. There's the K, and again, you probably won't get that to that. It's called a, um, um, it's called a rate law constant. So here's a plot. The red one must be the reactant getting less. So basically we have time along the x-axis and along the y-axis we have molar concentration. The green one is your product building up. Okay. So rate is I'm right on here so it doesn't go away. That's funny because rate, like how fast are you going, you would say your change in miles per change in time. That's how fast you're going. That's your rate. But when we're tracking a uh, reaction, your rate or your reaction rate is equal to your delta change in, and it's going to be molar concentration. We could track either the, uh, the reactant, R, over delta T, change in reactant as it goes down over time, or I'm going to show you how these are related, change in the formation of the product over time. Now, as I plotted this, okay, do you see where this is change in molar concentration of the reactant product, so that's what delta Y over time. That's delta X okay, for this particular graph. So, of course, that's the slope. That's the slope. So, we could actually, and it, you know, kind of look at the rate at different times here. Again, the red ones, the uh, reactant going away, and the green triangles are the products forming. So, for instance, we could take the slope of the line between the first two data points, and that slope would be our rate. That slope would be our rate. Now, of course, we could take the slope there. We could take the slope there. And I don't know if you've noticed, but it, it's, the slope is getting less. The slope is getting less. The rate is getting less. Okay, though, and actually, you guys are going to do a little bit of that. You can choose any two points and get a rate, but again, know that you're kind of calculating a moving target. Okay. It's fastest up there, and actually, I can go ahead and say this, um, emphasize this, that later on next week, we're going to talk about um, initial rates, okay? And initial rates are basically kind of the tangent to kind of the curve up there. We could take the rate over the period from what? Um, time zero to 10 seconds, the rate. And you could do the change in concentration, change in time, and you would get that slope right there. They're all a little bit different. You could do a rate from uh, when you started to 30 seconds out, and you get a different one. Okay. So the deal is, if you want to not choose a pair of points like we've been doing to get a rate, you know, change in concentration, change in time, but if you want to actually get the slope at any given time, basically you have to draw a line that's tangent to the curve at that point. And we're not going to have to be doing that. I just kind of want you to kind of think of it like that. So, for instance, at time is equal to what, 10 seconds? Well, let me do this this way. Yeah, time is equal to 10 seconds. That tangent line there would be a very good indication of the rate at 10 seconds. Okay, so rate. 
Okay, so you can see your data, and I don't have my data in front of me because I printed off but didn't grab it. So rate, reaction rate, and rate, by the way, I'll go ahead and emphasize that because we're going to kind of switch it up, I guess. When I say rate, that's the same thing as reaction rate. And my abbreviation for reaction is RXN. Okay, so it's the change in molar concentration of either the reactant or the product divided by the time interval over which that change occurred. That's what that's the way we say it. Now I'll go ahead and tell you though, um, if you're tracking the reactants, you are actually going to get a negative rate, and I'm going to kind of tell you how we have to normalize that. I'm going to try to switch this up here in a minute. And if you're tracking the formation of the product, you're going to get a positive rate of change there. All right. Okay, so like I said, that slide that you circled, if you go back there and look at the, um, the interval from zero to five seconds, okay, you should see at zero it was 0 0.200 molar. At five seconds, the reactant had diminished to 0 0.121 moles per liter. So we're going to do a little subtraction there, come up with a change in R. Um, notice, like I said, it's going to be negative because it's a reactant going away. And then to get the rate over that interval, which actually, I don't think I have on my slide, but if we do it like this, it's not going to be an instantaneous rate. It's going to be probably an average rate, just an average rate over that. Okay. So we just need to divide that by the time over which that change occurred, which of course is five seconds. I can even do that now. So units of rate are always going to be change in concentration per time. In this, this case, moles per liter per second. Okay, so if we divide negative 0 0.079 moles per liter by 5 seconds, um, I guess it's 5.0 seconds. Got a little sloppy for last there. You're allowed two significant figures. zero seconds. Um, so that's the rate. Now I should, like I said, I'm going to have to kind of clean up my game here in a minute, but th that is not necessarily the, the rate. That is the rate of change of the reactant. Okay, that's the rate of change of the reactant over time. Okay, so that was the first interval. And actually, um, since you could, I hope you guys buy this. Since just in this one little example, the stoichiometry is a one-to-one, -one, for every little particle of reactant, we get a particle of product. Because you kind of saw that when you saw the reactant go away in the product form. Okay. Then actually, if we were to do a similar exercise for the formation of the product, you would get the same. It would be positive, positive 0 0.016 moles per liter per second. Okay, so there's that one we just figured. And if we, um, I'm not going to do this for each one, but you could if you wanted to. Go back to the raw data if you wanted some practice. And you could come up with the rate with the next interval from 5 seconds to 10 seconds. Notice the rate is going down. But the rate of, um, the rate at which the reactant disappears because of the, uh, the relative amounts is equal to the rate at which the product appears. Okay. And it goes down, and it goes down. So the reaction rates are decreasing over time. I think that's kind of neat. Rates slow. Cool. And if you're working in homework or looking at my answer key, sometimes instead of breaking this out like this, sometimes I'll just say moles per liter per second. So same thing. Okay. Like I said, this is a special case and actually I think coming up on the next few slides, we need to step back and kind of look at reaction rates if, uh, and you're tracking something, you could track anything. And what do you do when the stoichiometry is not one across the board?
Okay. So, if you don't mind, I'm going to just go ahead and instead of reaction rate, I'm going to go put rate of change. R rate of change of P right here. Lobby. This is better. Rate of change of R. Rate of change of P. So it's not the the real rate, but you're pretty close in that case if the stoichiometric coefficient is one. So here's the deal. The, the, the real true reaction rates are always positive. You'll be like, well, what if I track a product? Well, here in the minute, I'm going to kind of say, take the absolute value up. <laughs> okay. What if I track a reactant? Okay, so it's always, always going to be positive. Okay. And there is another twist. So here we have um, one reactant going to form two products, A going to form B and C. But notice the relative proportions. Those are the stoichiometric coefficients. We get two parts of A um, uh, going to form two parts of B and one part of C. So if we track the rate of change of A, A and B, the rate of change of A and B are going to be the same. <laughs> okay, But the rate of change of C is going to be different. So the, the thing is, regardless of what we track, A, B, or C, we need to have the same reaction rate. There's only one reaction rate for this thing. Okay. So I'll kind of show you how this works through example. You see like another convention here. Um, we've talked about superscripts like the knots. Here we have a subscript zero. So hopefully you guys see that molar concentration of A zero. And I don't know if we run into this before, but that just means initial. So anytime you see subscript zero, that means initial. Okay, so the initial molar concentration of A is 0 0.100. Okay, we let 25 seconds elapse, and now the new molar concentration, not so surprising, has gone down to 0 0.060 moles per liter. Okay, and we could calculate a rate, and actually I think that's what we're going to do. We could come up with the rate of change of A, but then we're going to actually kind of take that rate of change of A, rate of change, not the, the, the rate, rate of change of A, we're going to link it to the rate of change of C, which you figure it takes two parts of A to make one part of C. So the rate of change of A seems like it's twice as fast, and you're right. So we have to say we have to normalize that here in a minute. If you're tracking A, basically you have to divide by two multiply by one half. If you're tracking B, you have to multiply by one half. If you're tracking C, since the stoichiometry is one, you just leave it alone. Okay, so that's basically what we're building up to. All right, so given that information over that time interval, we could come up with the rate of change of A. Um, so the final minus initial, so the final was 0 0.060 moles per liter. The initial was 0 0.100 moles per liter. Um, so 0 0.040 moles per liter is our delta A. Delta T obviously is 25 seconds. Okay, so if we take negative 0 0.040 moles per liter or molar divided by 25.0 seconds, you get the rate of change of A. The rate of change of A. Okay, that's cool. 0 0.0016 moles per liter per second. Around the two significant figures. Okay. Well, that was the first part of the question. What about the, the second part of the question? There's a couple ways to skin this cat, and there's some things in chemistry that I find kind of squishy, and showing it factor label because that's almost more intuitive than it's harder to show it. Okay. But this is one way to show it. So, for instance, if over that time interval, of 25 seconds, we saw 
basically A be depleted by 0 0.040 moles per liter. We know the stoichiometry between um, A and C is one mole of C forms for every two moles of A. Well, you can go ahead and use it as a stoichiometric coefficient, or stoichiometric, co stoichiometric ratio, excuse me, use those stoichiometric coefficients as a ratio. So now moles of A cancel, we're left with basically the moles of C that will be formed over that same time interval. So if that's the moles formed, uh, excuse me, the moles per liter formed, we can go ahead now and take that, um, that change, which is the amount that formed from zero, divided by the time interval, and voila, we have the rate of change of C. Okay, so the rate of change of C would look like this. Okay, 0 0.020 moles, um, moles per liter, divided by the time interval of 25 seconds. Round it to two significant figures and you get a rate of change of C for that same time interval of 0 0.0080 moles per liter per second, which is exactly half of the rate of change of A. And the rate of change of A was 0 0.0016. Okay. So that kind of makes sense. And so that's the answer to that one. But we still need to kind of come full circle in a way. We need to be able to, whether we track A or whether we track C or B, we need to say what is the reaction rate. So I told you it always has to be positive. Okay. So if we compare those two together, if we were to go ahead and negate the, the, the fact that A is a reactant and C is a product, so basically take the absolute value of of the A, make the negative go away. Now we got a factor of two. Okay, so here's the other thing. Regardless of what you track, whether it is a reactant or a product, you take the absolute value of. The other thing is you, you can look at it two ways. I think this says you divide the observed rate change by the stoichiometric coefficient. I like to say you multiply by 1 over the stoichiometric coefficient. It's the same diff. So if you go back to the previous slide, if we picked on A, okay, because it had coefficient of 2, and basically multiplied that rate by 1 over 2, we'd have it. So the, the, the real rate is that second one, the 0.0008 zero moles per liter per second. Okay? So, the one thing I don't like about the slide I'm looking at it is I wish instead of this right here, instead of taking a negative, since this is a uh, reactant, we knew it was going to be negative, so basically kind of applied an absolute value approach by taking a negative times a negative to make a positive. I think what you just should have done uh, is basically take the absolute value of. And these you can take the absolute value of, but since they're the products, they're always going to be positive. So, But the bottom line is, can you see where in all cases we're taking 1 over the stoichiometric coefficient? It's just that the stoichiometric coefficient of C is 1. That's a little squishy. But, you know, it makes sense that you don't want to have different reaction rates just depending upon what you chose to track. It has to be the, the reaction rate. So your homework that's going to be due on um, Monday you're going to be kind of going in and out and looking at kind of the reaction rate, how it kind of relates to the rate of change that you're observing of reactants or products. Okay? All right. So I know this assignment slide is clear at the end.
but I've broken it up this way in the past, and I really like doing it this way. So on Monday, we're going to come back and kind of look at why rates vary. And you already kind of told me uh, one of the things is basically all reaction rates slow over time because you have less of your reactant. And that's actually the concentration of the reactant is a factor of reaction rates. So let's take a look at these. And I was doing Facebook. Oh my gosh, you can find so many things on Facebook. And there was, um, one of the things I do is like a chemistry Facebook site and they had like um, uh, react factors affecting reaction rates or something like that. And so I, I snagged the picture and I pushed it out on Twitter. So I was like, how did you know we were talking about that today? Okay. I felt just a little guilty making the homework due, but you guys are going to have a long weekend. So not guilty enough, apparently. <laughs> we kind of need to get down the road on this topic. So for this question, um, notice you have two reactants going to form two products. Um, the initial description, they tell you that they give you the rate of change of A the rate of change of A. So remember the big M means uh, moles per liter. You can, I think you can leave it as a big M, I think. Um, so what is the rate of the reaction at this point? And so my hint was basically, um, I just had to put this together um, today because I didn't have these from last year. But the rate, the official rate is basically you can track the appearance or disappearance of anything you have to take the absolute value of that, and then you have to multiply it by 1 over the stoichiometric coefficient or divide by the stoichiometric coefficient. It's the same thing. Okay. So actually, that's kind of how you do A. Since the coefficient is 2, you'll have a the little red box. You'll have a 2. I did that again. And for B... Uh, B says, what is the rate of disappearance of, of B? Isn't that ironic? So this semester, what I kind of decided to do is to kind of put it this way. Now you're looking not for the rate, but the rate of, in this case, um, disappearance of B. So disappearance means actually it's going to be um, negative for reactants. So you're going to slap in a negative sign as far as I can tell. And then you're just going to multiply whatever you get in A times the stoichiometric coefficient for B, and it's 1. <laughs> so you should be fine there. Um, the next one, and if you look at my, my answer key for this that I did some years ago, you're going to see that I kind of did it differently. So if you be creative or meet me on the other side, but I think this will work good. C, uh, the rate of the formation of D, again, use a similar thing for B. So for this one, you have to use this figure. This figure looks really busy, but kind of the important line is the red line. That actually is the disappearance of hydrogen peroxide. So the chemical reaction is hydrogen peroxide breaking down to form water and oxygen. So that's the red line. The black line that you see, I knew there was one like this. The black line is the initial rate. This black line is basically a line tangent to that first point. And actually, as we get going, the initial rates is a very special, it's the fastest it's the initial rate. Um, the blue line is tangent to, I don't know, sometime in here, okay, the rate at that. But um, so it says at t is equal to 800 seconds, estimate how fast it's going. And I've done this different, different ways, different times, but if you're wondering about how fast is it going at this point, 800 seconds, what I said is maybe go ahead and take that point and that point and basically do an average rate. That's kind of what I was thinking. So you'll take those times, go ahead and pick off the concentrations, do a change of concentration divided by change in time, and voila, you're done. The next one has got to be like the easiest. If you think it's easy, I think it's easy, because it basically says at what time is the molar concentration of hydrogen peroxide 0.50 molar. All you got to do is put find 0.50 molar over here and come down and find the time. <laughs> Unless I'm missing something. Okay, so that's that one. This one, um, A going to form products. 
and it gives you the decrease in the molar concentration of A from time is equal to 71.5 seconds to 82.4 seconds. And you're supposed to come up with an average rate of change. Let's see. Well, what is the average rate? Oh, what is the average rate, which since this is actually the coefficient is 1, okay, you would get negative and make that positive. So take the absolute value of that. I think you can do that one just fine, too. Um, this one, again, A going to form products. Um, it gives you uh, the initial molar concentration of A at time zero, otherwise known as A zero. And then it says how much of the reactant you have left after one minute um, and after two minutes. That's cool. So basically, you can make a little table if you wanted to. Because you're supposed to go ahead and over those two time intervals from zero to one minute and from one minute to two minutes, go ahead and come up with the, um, the average rate, which again, stoichiometric coefficient is one. But notice that you're going to get negative change in concentration of A. Just take the absolute value of that. And then um, B, it's kind of like, you know, you should hopefully see that it slows down <laughs> your second time interval. Okay, so rate is inversely proportional to time. So it should slow over time. And then the last one looks like this. And actually for this one, I just copied and pasted what I had on the first one. It says, what is the rate of the formation of um, C? Uh, the rate of the reaction. Okay, because it gives you... Um, the reaction rate, the reaction rate, okay? So if you have the reaction rate, you can backtrack to the rate of change in a reactant or product by simply multiplying it by the stoichiometric coefficient and recognizing that if it is a product, it'll be positive. If it's a reactant, it'll be negative. Um, for the next one. So what I did for this one is I took the rate, which was um, uh, 1.76 times 10 to the negative fifth moles per, moles, per, uh, moles per liter per second. That's the change. Recognize that the coefficient of, um, of A is 1. Slapped on a negative since it's a reactant. But what that rate of change of A means is that is the moles per liter um, of A per second that will decrease. So the question is, is what will it be one minute later? Well, if that's the rate of change, if you take this times one minute, actually factor label, your time will cancel out 60 seconds. And you'll come up with the, the delta A, the delta, the molar concentration, change in the molar concentration of A. And then you apply that to what you started out with, which was, it's funny how, you know, all textbooks are a little different, but that would be the initial concentration today. Um, so for the last one, you do kind of a similar thing. If you recognize any time you have the rate of change, and this time, in this case, the rate of change of A, if you do the flip version of it, okay, we know that in one second it will change at this molar concentration. So this one actually would give it the more... Uh, or get, you can calculate the delta A from what they want it to change from to, and then actually that can be your term right there. Multiply by your target change in molar concentration. A little squishier, but okay. That's what I have, and we'll do those last few slides on Monday, go over your test on Monday, and oh, and there's a study session now, so. <laughs>